Hey, happy middle of the night. It's uh, Ramon again. And today we're going to talk about what elections would look like if a Bernie Sanders type had won the nomination. And it's um, not very easy to um, model that because we, again, we're talking about a hypothetical situation here in America. So let's talk about the closest approximation. There are countries where um, far-left socialists have won nominations and have even taken power. Brazil uh, was under the control of socialist um, leaders until last year. Just last year, they were their socialist leader was uh, ousted in an uh, impeachment, the first impeachment, I think, in the history of Brazil. The only other way you could be kicked out of power there was in a military coup. And sometimes, somehow they lost power in an even more pathetic way. But um, we're not talking about Brazil today. We're talking about the United Kingdom and why, <coughs> in my opinion, we have the perfect model of why socialist uh, far-left politics in the Western world, at least in the um, first world, is not going to go anywhere, uh, at least as long as um, people resist it and I'm trying to resist it I hope you're trying to resist it if we let these clowns come to power then uh, I promise you they will fuck everything up and basically we'll be left with bankrupt institutions and a dysfunctional nation that is ripe for uh, economic stagnation and uh, poverty okay they always claim, oh, we're, we're here to serve the poor. We're here to, you know, end income inequality. Yeah, they'll end up in the income inequality because there won't be anybody earning a ton of money. There'll just be a lot of poor people, a lot more poor people. You know, and then there will be people that are connected to the government and they'll have better conditions and that'll be the end of it. That's the way it works. And um, what happened is that in Britain, there's a current leader of the Labour Party, somebody, I made a video of him earlier, I'm reshooting it because, frankly, it was too long and not, not uh, uh, focused enough. But in the United Kingdom, there's the Labour Party. For the past 20 years, the Labour Party was more of a moderate center-left party. And eventually, because of the Tony Blair scandals and the poor leadership of the neoliberals that were... Um, keeping the party in the European Union and it led it into the Iraq war, um, the Labour Party swung left due to the election of a leader named Jeremy Corbyn. Now, what happened was that Jeremy Corbyn had long been, it's called a backbencher in, in uh, UK politics, and he was allowed to participate in debates because the Labour Party wanted to include a far-left candidate because they wanted to at least give progressive or, or uh, socialist British people the impression that they had a seat at the table without actually giving them, them a seat at the table. So they invited him to the debates, and lo and behold, he was just slaying the, the losers that were the moderate. Labour Party people. These were people, I think their names were Yvette Cooper and Owen Smith. They were just these polished um, upper class politicians that, you know, they, they would cavort in Europe and, and act superior. They were disconnected to the working class. And he wasn't. So Jeremy Corbyn won in a very similar fashion to one Bernie Sanders here. But unlike Sanders, he actually did win the Labour Party leadership contest. So we're going to talk a little about Jeremy Corbyn, but also about the conditions that preceded Jeremy Corbyn. You see, um, the Labour Party was plagued for many years with what's called entryist politics, okay? And Jeremy Corbyn certainly one of the people that would be considered a fan of entryist politics. What's entryist politics? It means that in a given party or in a given organization, you suddenly you, you have another group, a smaller group, a more militant group, trying to infiltrate the party and take it over by seizing control of the institutions and, and usually the youth wing 
and eventually supplanting the older generation by default because there'd be nobody else who is really interested in, in uh, leading the, 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 the party. The, the moderates end up becoming irrelevant because they can't communicate with the youth. And that's what happened with labor in the 80s, the 70s and 80s. There was this group called Militant, the Militant Tendency. They were led by a bunch of uh, working class, uh, hardcore uh, Trotskyists in cities like Liverpool. And um, <coughs> in many cases, these people were, <coughs> were sympathetic to the IRA, sympathetic to a lot of um, a lot of uh, hardcore left-wing causes around the world, and they eventually gained control of the city of Liverpool. And it said militants started vehement opposition to the conservative government of Margaret Thatcher, this is the BBC, attempting to resist a reduction in the city's grant from the central government by sending an illegal budget that allowed for more spending than there was income. And then it says they were breached in breach of Labor Party policies, says Peter Kilfoyle, a noted opponent militant who was a regional organizer for the Labor Party in the 1980s. They sought to go illegally against the government of the day when Labor Party policy was not to. Do, was not to. They were a party within a party. Their sole intention was to eat away at the Labor Party from the inside, taking away members and funding. They did it successfully. Support of militant point, supporters of Militant point to the wave of building it initiated in Liverpool, replacing slum housing and improving sports and other leisure facilities. But the council did not have enough money to pay for its program, and action by the district auditor was averted only by taking out loans, a move to apparently issue redundancy notes, notices to every single council employee, ostensibly as a negotiating tactic, was widely criticized. Labor leader Neil Kinnick used a conference speech to attack Militant for the grotesque chaos of a labor council, hiring taxis to scuttle around the city, handing out redundancy notices to its own work. That, that means that they were basically saying that they were ready to, to lay off workers in, in British speak. Redundancy, I think, is like talking about layoffs. In June 1986, Hatton was expelled. This is Derek Hatton, the subject of this article was expelled from the Labor Party after a disciplinary hearing. A number of other politicians and activists were also thrown out. Um, and, and then, so anyway, militant fell apart. It, it became kind of this uh, expression of how uh, un, unhinged the left became in England in the, in the 80s. And because of their unreasonable positions and their lack of, of compromise, the, cons the conservatives in those years just kept winning and winning and winning. It was, it was almost a, um, a, they were the worst enemy of their own party, the Labor Party. Um, and there was no effective opposition there at the time. So eventually Labor came back under the form of New Labor under Tony, Tony Blair. A lot more moderate, had a lot more um, neoliberal policies, very successful from 1997 through 2010, I believe. They controlled the government. But what happened was that because of the Iraq war especially, the, instead, of, instead of just being able to complain about Blair's pro-business and anti-labor agenda as the head of the Labor Party, um, because of the Iraq war, Backbenchers such as Der Jeremy Corbyn and and uh, I think his name is um, Dennis Skinner. There's another guy named um, John McDonnell, uh, Ken Livingston. The, the, they're they're all these old labor people that are consistently militant. They're for socialist government. The, in in the case of uh, Corbyn, he's very radical on foreign affairs, very pro-Palestinian, very anti-Israeli, and they, they tapped into immigrant communities, the, what they call in, in, in uh, Britain the Asian community. They call them the Asian community. What they really usually mean is the Muslim community because they mean South Asia. They, they, don't, mean, they don't mean the Chinese. They don't really care about the Chinese or, or, or the, the you know Malaysians or whatever, unless they're Muslims and, and the... 
Therefore, the Labour Party began, became the home of many radical Muslim activists, or, or in some cases, just identity Muslim activists that were uh, actively um, preaching against the Jews. And there's just been this wave after wave of um, people being suspended from labor because they embarrassed the party by publicly saying statements that were so anti-Semitic that it, it's, it's clearly shown that um, whereas in the 80s, the far right, you know, the, the actual far right, the, the, the white power movement in England was the most anti-Semitic. The, the, they've been completely supplanted. The far right in England is, is now usually more anti-Muslim than it is anti-Jew. And therefore, um, labor uh, has had this problem with, they've had a problem basically with, with uh, anti-Semitism. They've had a problem with, um, you know, a majority of the population believing that they're a party that is, is uh, talking in good, good faith about policies for the entire British people. Um, there's, there's a number of other complicating factors, okay? Corbyn, since he was elected, has relied on the support of a core group of activists known as Momentum. And Momentum parallels in many ways Militant, which is a group that we were just talking about in the 80s. Um, and what Momentum does is they are the same thing. They just, they're an entryist group. They come in, it says, okay, so before I get to what it says, they come in and they, they try to take over branches of the Labour Party throughout England throughout or throughout throughout the United Kingdom, you know, that because it's not just England, it's Scotland, uh, Wales, Northern Ireland, but mainly England, because England is the center of the Labour Party. The rest of the country, Labour is very weak, um, including Scotland, by the way, where they once were rather strong. It says last week, this was in March. So this was, this was probably the third week of March. The Observer revealed de details of a secret recording of a meeting at which Momentum's founder, John Landsman, outlined plans for its activists to build influence at all levels of the party in order to ensure a hard left successor is installed when Jeremy Corbyn departs. Landsman also said Momentum would affiliate with the union Unite, boost its finances if Len McCluskey remained as general secretary, although a spokesperson later said he had been speaking in an aspirational manager, manner and Unite insisted there were no such plans. Landsman made clear on tape that his aim was to require labor membership into the rule book in order that momentum could build formal links with the party and the country's biggest and richest union. The revelations prom prompted labor's deputy leader, Tom Watson, to warn of that the future of the party was at stake from a wave of entryism as serious as any since the battles with militant in the 1980s. It can now be revealed that Landsman reassured activists at the same taped meeting that people expelled from labor would still be welcome to participate in its activities, if not in its ruling bodies and committees. This is despite Momentum's new constitution saying that any new member has to be a labor member and that all existing ones should join. Asked by an activist at the meeting in Richmond, Southwest London on March 1st about what role people suspended or expelled from labor could play in momentum in the future. Landsman stated, I see no reason why they should not carry on on the basis that most people who have been expelled have been expelled unfairly. The Labor Party Compliance Unit has been trying to kick them out. There is no one in momentum who wishes to exclude people. So this, this, this is like This, this is related to the whole issue of people like Ken Livingston. It says, Labor sources said a decision on whether to expel former Labor, former London Mayor Ken Livingston from Labor over alleged anti-Semitic remarks last year will be announced by the party this week. Livingston has said that if the decision is to expel him, he will take action in courts. Um, here they are shilling for money. This is The Guardian, a pro-Labor publication. So... Here, here's what I think, okay? And I'm not, it's not just me. This, this is actually what's going on. I'm, I'm not even and from Britain, obviously. You can hear from my voice. But um, basically, this, this is as if Bernie Sanders had taken over the Demo Democratic Party here 
And the rest of the party had realized that this wacko who has all of these other idiots um, working for him, uh, they, they, they start to recoil in fear and they're like, you have to get rid of these, these wackos. You know, you have Cornell West, you have all these um, other people that were supporting Sanders. Kill, Killer Mike, I actually respect. I think he's, he's a very smart guy. But, you know, that if let's say there were people with ideas that are not in the mainstream, it doesn't have to be what's happening in labor. But in terms of, of the Democratic Party, they, they, they are doing the same thing with Sanders supporters. You know, there, there's there's a guy even this is a little innocuous. There's a guy who has pro-life opinions in his personal life. A lot of Democrats are getting on him to be gone. They don't want him in the party at all because they can't accept it they can't accept a difference of opinion that's what happened and is happening in the labor party people are scared that these people will um basically alienate their supporters um so we're going to see something shake out soon there's a general election in june for the british parliament um, where labor is expected to lose a lot of seats. Now, why is it that labor has lost so much support in England? Now, one of the reasons is because of Brexit. Whereas the Conservative Party in the UK allowed its, par its party members and even its members of parliament to line up on different sides of the issue, the Labor Party tried to enforce discipline even though its leader, Jeremy Corbyn, is by far one of the least pro-EU um, Labor Party members. There, is plenty, there were plenty of Labor Party members that actually didn't support the EU. There were two that uh, members of parliament that actively campaigned against the EU, against for the Brexit. Uh, they wanted to leave the EU. They were, they were Kate Hoey and there was uh, Gisela Stewart or Giselle Stewart, I think her name is pronounced. And both of these people were full-on Labor Party members, and they said, you know, the European Union does not represent the working class. We're going to try to get it out. We're going to try to get out of it. Now, Jeremy Corbyn, as the leader, couldn't get away with it because there were so many people in the party that were full-on pro-EU uh, people that he, he could not have maintained discipline among the leadership, so he had to support it, but he supported it half-assedly, and they hated him for it, and they tried to unseat him last year in a special election, which he won. Now it's going to be a different story. There's going to be a major schism in the Labor Party, and the majority of, of um, the mainstream members are going to defect, I believe. They're going to go support a mainstream EU supporting party, or, or uh, as they're called, um, Remainers, they're going to support the Liberal Democrats, mainly. The Labor Party was, was going to lose a lot of members, is going to lose a lot of seats, and is, I, I think it might even become the third largest party in Parliament instead of the second. It could, could possibly uh, lose a lot of members to other parties, too. There's no telling how bad they'll do. Yeah, or, you know, it could be that people are exaggerating. They could they could just remain in the opposition, but there's almost nobody who's predicting that they're going to win the election just because they don't have any sort of, you know, the, even though the, the, the Corbinite wing is called momentum, as a party, a par the party as a whole has no momentum. And that's one of the problems that people don't realize with the Bernie Sanders wing. Look, Bernie Sanders did stand up for, during the election at least, he, stand, he stood up for a number of ideas that are popular among a certain sector of the population, especially the youth, especially uh, at some point rural people, people people in, in um, you know, rural communities that, that had lost jobs or, or uh, former industrial workers. Also among the black community, there, were, there was a certain sector of the black community that was very... Um, receptive to the Bernie ideas. But if you look at the broader picture, they he does not have the support that his um, backers think that he does. And um, one of the problems is that he supports 
his principles to the point where he doesn't realize that not everybody's ready for his type of politics. Um, I want to say that a great example was when he he supported a candidate in in a Senate race last year named Misty Snow. Now Misty Snow, uh, let me pull her up. Um, Misty Snow is a transgender woman or a thing, trans transgender person. Sorry, I'm not gonna. I'm not trying to be a, a jackass, but um, Misty Snow ran for Senate in Utah, which is probably the least. The, the least the, the least um pro transgender state in the country so they, they supported a transgender activist uh, in a senate race against Mike Lee one of the more popular senators in the country and um now she's running for the house and it says the transgender democrat has virtually no chance whatsoever in the deep red state Perhaps this isn't the point. As The Hill reported, Snow made headlines last year despite her fantastically meager showing in the U.S. Senate race against Mike Lee. Lee wobbed her last November, taking 68.15% to her 27.06%. And it says that he, you know, it even shows here. This is something, I like PJ Media sometimes. They have like some good, some good uh, graphics at least, you know, ideas. Um, they, they, they kind of lay out some of their articles the way I would. Um, it even says that he took it <laughs> having seven more, seven percent more of the vote than he did in 2010. Um, and it says she's now, now she's targeting a congressional seat that she may lose even more spectacular. And yes, she chose even the last name Snow. Last year, with your support, I was able to make history as the first woman to run for U.S. Senate in the state of U Utah and the first trans person to run for U.S. Senate anywhere in the country, Snow declared in a statement on Twitter. I learned much from that campaign, and I'm officially announcing my campaign for Congress in Utah's 2nd District. And, you know, the, th this is somebody who was... She, they say, to make matters worse, Snow is a very liberal Democrat. Her campaign platform mimicked that of Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, whom she endorsed, who is too liberal for the Democratic Party, except when it came to running for president. Snow calls for a $15 minimum wage, according to The Hill. Um, and I believe that, in many ways, this type of, uh, you know, just just far left politics turns people off in parts of the country and Utah would be one of them. Now, if she were to run in a state like um, New Hampshire, I, I don't know, maybe she would have gotten a better share of the vote. If she would have run in a st state like Massachusetts, she would have run a, gotten a better share of the vote. You know, New Jersey, she would have gotten a better share of the vote. I think that what's happening in Britain is the perfect metaphor for what happened what would have happened if Bernie Sanders would have been the nominee? Now you could think I'm wrong. You could think, oh, you you fucking, you know, you you fucking capitalist. Well, how could you not believe that Bernie Sanders? He's the most pop popular politician in the country. You don't even know what would have happened if he would have faced Donald Trump in the election. It would have been a different type of a d debate. It would have been a, a much funnier, uh, in, in some respect. Well, I don't know if it could have been funnier than it was, but. You know, you, you would have seen him and Trump basically going at each other would have would have been hilarious. I don't know. I, I think that he would have still lost because there is still this. Um, <laughs> he just can't get a, get out of his own way. And, and these ideological gargoyles like Sanders, like Jeremy Corbyn, I don't think that they're going to get anywhere uh, without um, first transforming a massive part of the country and I don't think that the country is ready for it but you know there's a lot of ways I could be wrong I'm actually planning to try and talk to a Sanders supporter later this week on this on this um, channel so please stay tuned this is Ramon bold like a leopard 
Uh, have a great week, and we'll talk to you maybe tomorrow, uh, maybe later. You know, we'll see what happens. Have a great night.